Hello, this is the third of my videos on the British abolitionist movement, this one dealing with the parliamentary campaign from 1788 until 1792. One of the earliest decisions of the London Abolitionist Society in 1787 was that to achieve their purposes they had to have their views effectively represented in Parliament. To prohibit the British slave trade would require an act of Parliament and this could only be accomplished by gaining a majority of votes in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, as well as the final royal assent. This was an audacious goal, all the more so when we remember that the abolitionists were seeking to accomplish a major change in social policy that would have a strongly negative impact on an important part of the British economy, and that the late 18th century British Parliament was an elitist institution that did not represent the mass of the British people, but many of whose members had interests that led them to support either the slave trade or the West Indian planters who relied on the slave trade for their workforce. The abolitionists were particularly fortunate in gaining the support of the young member of Parliament for the county of Yorkshire, William Wilberforce. A tiny man with a great voice and a reputation for integrity and enormous eloquence, Wilberforce was a conviction politician who had recently become an Anglican evangelical and was convinced that only moral reform would counter the widespread vice and immorality that weakened Britain. Contacted and recruited to the abolitionist cause in the spring of 1787, Wilberforce devoted much of his energy to the goal of securing parliamentary approval for the abolition of the slave trade. Although Wilberforce became a convinced abolitionist, I should note in passing that his social views were otherwise largely conservative, in obvious contrast to those of both the Quakers and Clarkson. For example, Wilberforce believed that women and the lower classes should be submissive, and when the French Revolution began, he and Clarkson responded quite differently, Clarkson welcoming events in France and Wilberforce opposing them. Wilberforce's work in the House of Commons was an essential part of the abolitionists' goal of ending the slave trade, but they rightly saw his work as a component part of their wider campaign. They realized that it was not enough to simply point to what they considered a moral evil and gain rapid support. In the first instance, Wilberforce could only proceed effectively in Parliament if he had detailed information about the workings of the slave trade, which was largely provided by Clarkson and his associates. Then, as the abolitionist movement developed, there was a growing swell of public opinion marked most obviously by the abolitionists' successive petitions and the sugar boycott. Reactions to public opinion in parliamentary circles were ambivalent, however. Britain was not a democracy, and whilst parliamentarians listened to the concerns of their own constituents, they did not accept any notion of popular sovereignty, as evidenced by parliamentary reactions to both the American Revolution of 1775 to 83, and the French Revolution, which began in 1789. Yet at the same time, the evident signs of an upwelling of public sentiment was not something to be altogether ignored or disregarded. As to the parliamentary campaign against the slave trade, this began in a small way in 1788. Wilberforce was then ill, so a proper debate was delayed, but another member of Parliament, Sir William Dolben, raised the issue of overcrowding of slaves on British ships, leading to ineffectual legislation limiting slave numbers proportional to the size of ships and requiring the employment of a ship's doctor and the keeping of a register of deaths for both crewmen and slaves. More significantly, a committee of the Privy Council began an inquiry into the slave trade, which collected statistics and reports and gave the abolitionists opportunity to put a lot of the information that they had collected into the public record. Witnesses called by the committee included both Newton and Clarkson. The committee's report was presented in April 1789 
and ran to 850 pages. Shortly thereafter, Wilberforce opened the first full parliamentary debate on the slave trade, but was sidelined by pro-slavery MPs who instigated a delaying mechanism by insisting that the House of Commons should conduct its own inquiries into such a weighty matter before proceeding. These lengthy new committee hearings finally produced a report of some 1,700 pages and delayed any further consideration of the trade until April 1791. The abolitionists were then defeated in the Commons by a vote of 163 to 88. Whatever popular support the abolitionists were beginning to enjoy, pro-slave trade and pro-slavery forces still predominated in the Commons. Crucial to these forces was the West Indies lobby, a parliamentary block of MPs linked to the West Indian plantation owners and the ports. But many British notables, including cabinet members, also had financial interests in the West Indies and supported the continuation of slavery and, by extension, the slave trade. By 1791, responding to the success of the abolitionists in marshalling popular support, the pro-slavery forces, both outside and inside Parliament, had become increasingly well organised. Those with financial interests in the West Indies and the British slave ports were natural allies who both felt threatened by the abolitionists' initial successes. A well-financed West India Committee began its work to provide a counter-lobby to the abolitionists and seek public support. Prominent parliamentary speakers opposed to abolition included Bannister Tarleton, MP for the slave trading port of Liverpool in the House of Commons, and one of the King's sons, the Duke of Clarence, in the Lords. The pro-slavers pointed to the important role played by the West Indian plantations in the British economy, stressed the involvement of African rulers and traders in the slave trade, and alleged that the abolitionists' view both of the slave trade and of Caribbean slavery was prejudiced and misinformed. The 1791 defeat spurred the abolitionists to make greater efforts. One result was the production of an abstract of the evidence, a short summary of the evidence published by the Commons Select Committee in 1791, it was only 162 pages in length, compared to the original 1700. This was widely distributed and easily read both by parliamentarians, who might have been daunted by the massive original report, and by ever greater numbers of the general public. The abstract provided a clear and shocking account of the tortures and abuses inflicted on the slaves, seeking to persuade through documented evidence rather than moral or religious exhortation. A second result was growing abolitionist activity at the local level. This included a boycott of slave-produced Caribbean sugar, in which possibly over half a million Britons eventually participated in a mass-action political campaign designed to put pressure on the West Indian sugar industry and its supporters. The abolitionists also repeated their earlier tactic of petitioning, with some 390,000 people putting their names to abolitionist petitions to Parliament by 1792. A second parliamentary debate was held in April 1792. This was far more favourable to the abolitionists, with the Prime Minister himself, William Pitt, speaking strongly and eloquently in support of Wilberforce's notion. However, the Home Secretary, Henry Dundas, called for gradualism in implementation, and an amendment was introduced such that abolition would be deferred until 1796. The amended bill was passed by the House of Commons by 230 votes to 85, but this was still too much for the House of Lords, and they refused to pass the bill, insisting also on holding their own lengthy hearings on the slave trade. The abolitionists' campaign then stalled, 
largely as a result of the onset of war and a change in the national mood, which I will discuss in the next video. Thank you.